Coming up right now, a man challenges himself to a grueling drinking mission, and it, all we can say is don't try this at home, okay? <laughs> also coming up, to tip or not to tip, it is the question that caused one delivery person to argue with her customers. We're going to dish on who's in the right and who's in the wrong. A little bit later on, Dad goes viral after his refusal to help around the house. But hold your fire. All right, don't <laughs> worry. His reasoning, you might actually agree with. Daily Flash starts right now. Get ready for trending news and entertainment. This is Daily Flash with your hosts, Andrea Jackson and Mitch English. The fun starts right now. This is Daily Flash. Hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Jackson. I am Mitch English, welcoming you to Daily Flash. We're about to kick off this week on a good note. We, we got us a great week all planned out. Everything's great. And uh, we also going to be checking with our buddy Matt Newlittle. Matt, how, how's it hanging, buddy? That's personal, but it's a little windy. Oh, windy. You know, it has been. You're right. We're going to check in with Maddie just a little bit later on. He just on. said it's warm in here. I feel I feel it. You know, it's warm. You can feel that. You yeah. can, definitely. This is the time of year I love going outside. I, I we, we've been getting a, a just, you know what I'm talking about? Just this weather is yeah. unbelievable. That nice breeze. But not the humidity is still here in Florida. A little but bit, just that yeah. Nice breezes. Out uh, there. Can you believe that we are heading into the first week of November? Yeah, this that's week, so weird. Right? And our clocks fall back this weekend. Yeah, too. I'm not. I'm waiting, when are we going to get rid of that? That's a whole know. show we need to talk <laughs> yeah, about. It's right, right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, hey, have you heard that the Olympics have added a new sport? An another one. Okay. Break dancing was last uh, summer Olympics. What's this one? You ready for this one? Okay. Flag football. Yes, I got a chance. <laughs> No, no flag football. Bitch! Uh, <laughs> no, wait, no, 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 just said flag football. Flag football, yes. Here's my question, like, how do you pick the team? Not stag football. Oh, okay. Flag. Like just only guy. Yeah, yeah, flag yeah. football. How do you pick the team? Is there a national flag <laughs> football league? There is. Yeah. Uh, our, Caleb, our, our camera guy says yes, there is. I, but, uh, see, I think football, first off, uh, it should be tackled. I mean, it, it should be, people should be getting hurt. Pulling little, you know, flag. ribbons out. Yeah. Is I, that really an Olympic sport? I agree, yeah. And how is it that much different than actual football outside of contact, right? Yeah. At this point, yeah. I mean, there was a time, I think, earlier in life where the Olympics actually meant, meant something. <laughs> I remember one year there was Olympic ice sculpting, which you would sculpt. No. Has got my hand to the head. There was and, not. It was during the Winter Olympics. And you would sculpt stuff. And, <laughs> and, and then they... But, but that's like art, so how it's a subjective almost. Basket right? weaving is that next? That's going to be. There's well, a who would have who would have thought they'd go? Let's have a sport where you ride on skis and then shoot things. Yeah, <laughs> well, there's that. But then there's a new movie coming out. George Clooney's directing on the rowing oh, team no. from like the 30s about how they went to go Olympic gold, and it's this great. You know, we've had the miracle on ice. Yeah. Is there going to be a movie about the flag <laughs> yeah. football team that you know really rose from the ground? Yeah. Maybe Bill Burr will do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see him doing that. <laughs> I, I can't tell you. I got to go to the, the Winter Olympics uh, back in 2002. In Salt Lake? Yeah, in Salt Lake. And I sat right next to, and I tell this story all the time. I sat ne next to the 1980 hockey team. No they were like, way! Not, I'm telling you, uh, miracle I, on ice. Yes, miracle <gasps> on ice. So we're standing there. Uh, I was sitting there, and everybody's getting along. And all of a sudden, I look back, and they're all gone. And it was right before they lit the flame. And so wow. well, I, go, I bet you they are. That was a cool moment. That is definitely a moment like, in time. I could sit by the, uh, the 1980 hockey team. About four or five rows away, but it was still cool. So, I was in proximity. All right. So this might be an Olympic sport. I don't know <laughs> if it's a good idea. I know guy. Maddie's been trying to do this, haven't you, Matt? Hey, we're, we're going for the gold on this you one. Are, you would win the gold. You would win gold. <laughs> one man, he was aiming to drink 2,000 pints in 200 days, has finally reached his goal. Well, did you hear the bell go just off now. for him? Yes. Matt just, just finished now. his. Uh, he's trying to actually, over the past 200 days, he's been keeping track of uh, basically drinking gold online. And before we go any further, we have to throw out a disclaimer. We do not encourage anyone to no. take on a challenge like this. Back to John. He just kicked back pint number 2,000, completing its 200 day challenge. Come on. And now that he's checked that off his list, he's going to be spending the next 2,000 days allowing his liver to recover. <laughs> um, you know, we hear, I uh, think about like supersize me where a guy goes and, you know, yeah. eating McDonald's for a certain amount of time. You know, and, and all intents and purposes, beer is it's got everything, it's all natural. It's got water, it's got hops Ooh. and barley and but it's well, got have that you alcohol heard the story it. about how they they give the um, folks in Ireland Guinness at the senior citizens home I've because not heard it's that. so full of nutrients and vitamins and minerals? They get a pint, of, at least a pint of Guinness every See, day. I, I think that's you know if it works, yeah. right? 
I mean, that's why I want to go out. I'll say Tommy Lee probably takes the cake for the Olympic sport of <laughs> drinking. Yeah. Right? No kidding two, at all. Two, uh, two, uh, two, uh, two gallons, gallons, two gallons of, of vodka. Two gallons of vodka a day. Which blows my mind. Well, a Texas father has been in the social media crosshairs for his take on not helping around the house. Take a look. I don't help my wife cook. I don't help her clean, do laundry, take care of the kids. None of that. Because I do what I am supposed to do as a father and a husband. I cook. I clean. I do the laundry. I take care of the kids. I can't help my wife do those things because they are my job too. Change the way you speak. Change the way you think. Okay, well, the father of four since changed his tune, shares a perspective he has come to embrace. He said when he realized the impact of the language he was using, he decided to change the way he viewed his responsibilities. The 32-year-old dad said he wanted to share his video to raise awareness about yeah. how common this line of thinking is among many parents. It's a joint effort, really, when I, it I comes agree. to taking care of stuff around the house. I was wondering why my UPS delivery was so long, but at least <laughs> now, uh, you know, he got his point across there. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think it was neat how he said it, because when this initially came out, Everybody's like, oh, well, he's saying he's not going to help. But he says it's a responsibility. Yeah. And I agree with him. It, it, yes. It's a family responsibility. Everybody's in it. Yeah. There's, and when you say the word help, but I think it's it's, it's schematics, yeah. right? Uh, do I have, am I saying that name word wrong? Schematics or schematics? Schematics. I, I, I like it. Yeah, schematic. Okay. Sure. My wife says I say it weird. So anyway. She says schematics? I, maybe I was saying schematics and she goes, it's schematics. <laughs> and I go, well, you're a doctor, so you know more. You know me, more. So I'll shut up. <laughs> I'll move forward now. Gwyneth Paltrow is ready to finally take an exit. And I think an applause. A lot of people are saying we're tired of this. Yeah. You're very good. Oh, a slow clap, too. Yeah. The 51-year-old Oscar winner detailed what she wants her life to look like when she retires, adding that she will disappear from public life and no one will ever see her again. Paltrow also uh, plans on selling her online website, Goop, that she sold, uh, started rather back in 2008. No word on those candles. I'm not sure if anybody wants those candles. I hope Google not. Google it. You Burn know what no, I'm talking about. No, no, no. Uh, she last appeared in 2019's Avengers Endgame alongside Robert Downey Jr. She was also in the movie The Politician on Netflix in 2019. She admitted during an interview that she forgot that she played Pepper Potts yeah. in 2017's Spider-Man Homecoming. She said she totally forgot. And keep in mind, she grew up in a Hollywood yeah, family. Yeah, she did. And yeah. it's, you know, it... Things were open, doors were opened up. It might have been a little easier yeah. life. And sometimes there's something to that where, it, you know, if things are a little bit easier, you have a different attitude about stuff. Right, know? nepotism, nepotism makes a huge right. difference when it comes to Hollywood. And she's grown up, like you said, in the spotlight. So yeah. I think she's probably earned her time off. And I think she's her her priorities have changed. She's like, I kind of want to be able to be at home and just kind of uh, fade away from the spotlight. I think so. Which is great for her. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, a frustrated delivery driver was caught on camera engaging in a heated exchange with a couple over a tip for a large grocery order. Take a look. If you can pay for the service, you can pay for the tip as well, don't you? No, I can't. Okay, yeah. that's none of your business. Then you should have went to the store and got it yourself. That's none of your business. No, it is my business because you didn't tip Wait, me. So why, why do we have to tip you? I didn't say you have to. I'm confused why you didn't when I gave you guys a great service. Well, clearly, I brought we all to. this stuff. To, do you know how heavy this stuff was? Oh boy. Well, the dispute dragged on for several minutes. It finally ended with a worker unloading the groceries while one of the customers claimed they were going to file a report. Viewers had mixed reaction to the video with some siding with the driver while others defended the customers, arguing that a tip is optional, not mandatory. She got everything out and then she put it all back in the car and left. And they were worried. They're like, how do we know that you're taking this back to the, uh, the, store? the store? And then the store would have to restock it. And a lot of times certain items, if they once they leave the store, yeah. they th have to throw it away. So that's that's another thing. So, that, but that's a whole other issue. The issue comes down to tipping. Number one, you should tip no matter what. Yes, okay. I agree. And, and we we were talking about this during during uh, the, before the show started. The best way, if you uh, want to insult somebody, if that's what your intention is, is not to not tip them, but tip them an extremely low amount. Yeah. And that will say more about the fact that you're consciously knowing. But first off, don't do that. You know, find out what the issue is. If there was bad customer service, which we don't know because we didn't see what happened yeah. beforehand. But always tip, no matter what, you know? I do think, though, if you're, if you've signed up to be a delivery person, right, whether it's food, whether it's groceries, whether it's whatever, in one of these services, 
you know, you're expecting a tip, but it's not mandatory. It's not mandatory. So for her to show up at the home and load the groceries and then say, I'm not leaving without a tip is inappropriate. I'm sure that's sort of a <laughs> violation of some kind right. of contract. I do know like on Uber Eats, they give you the opportunity is after it's dropped off, you can tip yes. or even add on to your tip. Like, well, yes. that's such great service. I'm going to add a little bit more. I don't like tipping beforehand. I just, no. I, I don't like that at all. Yeah. I want to know what kind of service I'm getting because that's what a tip is for is the service, not necessarily the, the food. Have you ever spent a lot of money on a meal and then you're like, oh, that is the biggest waste of money and the most disappointing experience. And then you're like, now do I have now, to tip? I got a tip. You, you know, and uh, because the waitress might have given you great service and yes. the food was bad, maybe right on the note saying, yeah. or just tell the waitress, yeah. hey, this steak or whatever you had, it really was horrible. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about missing car payments, questions missing, and we'll have those answers coming up. And welcome back to Daily Flash. I'm Mitch English. In today's Financially Speaking, inflation is not the only way to monitor the direction of the economy. Some say missing car payments are actually another sign. Joining us now to talk more about this is Nora Naughton. She's the senior reporter for Autos in, from Insider.com. I got to tell you, Nora, I, I'm certain there's more, so many people, including myself, we miss car payments. It, it, it's frustrating. And the thing is, it's just so hard to get back on track. But what's some of the key factors that we're seeing that we're seeing actually increased missed car payments in uh, here in the United States? Yeah, uh, well, this is coming off uh, several years now of rising car prices and car prices always rise. But the last three or so years has been exponential. I mean, just uh, every month is a new record average transaction price to a point now where, uh, you know, on average, people are paying 50, 60, $70,000 for a car. Um, and uh, so what what we're seeing is people uh, taking out these car loans that they really can't afford. Um, you know, uh, they don't put down down payment right. that they need to put down, but it's right. loans that they can't afford. Okay, well, now, how is this actually impacting maybe the financial well-beings of families in the United States? Is it really putting them behind? Are they able to catch back up? Yeah, no, it's... Uh, it's definitely, you know, it's not good to miss your car payment sure. in general. Uh -huh. And on top of that, it's in the this macroeconomic landscape of uh, rising inflation everywhere, right? So they miss their car payment and then, uh, you know, the eggs are $10 or whatever, you know, the the latest thing is. Right. Um, it just, it adds on to that. It's not happening in a vacuum. It adds on to that. Yeah, I can uh, imagine so. Well, wait, is there any certain dip demographics, maybe even regions of the country that we're seeing more of this, maybe compared to others? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, okay. well, not probably either way. I'm sure it's one of those things where everybody can, it can relate to it. But let's talk about how car missing car payments actually correlate with the economic indicators and what they actually, that insight shows us about the economy. Is there some relation there? Yes. So the, uh, the auto industry, uh, much like the, the housing industry is a really good indicator of economic health. Um, Demand for cars is uh -huh. uh, an indicator of uh, consumer demand overall, and uh, a, you know the ability to buy cars is uh, indicative of you know buying power overall. It makes sense. In the, yeah, uh, in the economy, um, it, you know, cars and houses those are your two biggest purchases, so they're always going to be big indicators of economic health. What are banks and other financial institutions actually taking to actually to help those that are struggling with car payments? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you know, hey, at least you're honest about it. We're all together here. I want to thank you so much there. Nora, of course, and you want to find out more information on our economy and of course, what's going on in the world, check out Insider dot com and it is something you know all of us actually have, have to go through mm. sometimes you know where you, you know you pay one bill to another and hopefully you're able to get out usually you try to see yourself at the other end of it but sometimes they get so far far into debt yeah. you're, they don't see any other side and then they just give up hope 
Right, as Nora mentioned, you know, sometimes it comes down to, well, do I buy groceries this week yeah. or do I make my car payments? So you're kind of in this really tough spot. And with used car sales and the price for a used car, thirty to forty thousand yeah. dollars, it's outrageous. Like, you know, there's there's I think there's maybe one car you can buy brand new for twenty five grand and that's the lowest and, price you and can good get. Good luck. Good luck with that one yeah. too. And, and you worry too when you buy a used car, the fact that it's uh, gonna come it's good like, thing I'm getting another phone. This exactly weekend. your cell phone's <laughs> covered on insurance, right? But but when you you uh, you use car you come with problems too. And so yeah. if the car breaks down then then it's you're back then in you're the same boat that, true. As the holiday shopping season starts to warm up, there's a lot to consider when it comes to your budget. Here's Jeanette Cap with ways to turn your spending into earning power during the holidays. Thanks so much for having me. The holidays are really right around the corner and from travel to gifts to entertaining family and friends, there's a lot to budget for. I'm so excited for Thanksgiving, Hanukkah, Christmas. So I've been looking for ways to turn my spending into earning this holiday season. Take advantage of the great benefits that cashback credit cards like Chase Freedom Flex can offer you. Whether you're grocery shopping because you're in charge of cooking for the holiday festivities or fueling up before a long road trip to see family. And by using your credit card throughout the year on everyday purchases, you'll always earn as you spend. Other ways that you can use your cashback this holiday season include flying in a grandparent as a surprise on Thanksgiving or helping to offset the cost of hosting relatives during the holidays. And don't forget that in addition to cashback rewards, your credit card may offer benefits like purchase protection or extended warranty protection on gifts you're purchasing for friends and family this holiday season. And beyond the holiday season, make sure you take advantage of all of your credit card rewards and benefits, including earning cashback. It can really help take the sting out of rising costs on everyday essentials from groceries to gas. And if you don't have a rewards card, Consider opening a Chase Freedom Unlimited or Freedom Flex cashback credit card. The best part? New card members earn a $200 welcome bonus in addition to 5% cashback on up to $12,000 gas station and grocery purchases within the first year. You can visit creditcards.chase.com to learn more on how you can start earning rewards and cashback for the upcoming holiday season. Until next time, happy cashback and rewards redemption season. Hey, by the way, check us out on social media. We are everywhere. This week's boss lady, she's an international best-selling author. She calls Orlando home with her family, and she is a breast cancer survivor. Please welcome Kristen Harmel to Daily Flash. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Hi. It's so great to see you. Great to see you, too. Let's Thank get you. things kicked off here and talk about your latest book, The Paris Daughter. Yeah, so The Paris Daughter, which came out in June, is a World War II story about resilience, redemption, and kind of leaving behind those things that we let sit on our shoulders and weigh us down. It's about two mothers, two daughters, an allied bomb that falls where it shouldn't in the suburbs of Paris during World War II, and a storyline that takes us all the way to 1960 New York, where um, sort of the reawakening of old mysteries leads the two mothers to answers they couldn't have imagined uh, that change everything for their lives going forward. It, it's so thrilling to see your success. I've known you for a number of years and yes, you know, yes. you're an inspiration when it comes to writing. What led you down the path of becoming an author and what uh, sort of inspiration can you share for those at home who are trying and struggling to be an author? Uh, you know, it's what I've always wanted to do. I, I mean, truly, it's been my career goal since I was a little girl. There was a brief blip where I thought I wanted to be a pop star, but the whole lack of singing ability got in the way of that. <laughs> um, no, it's uh, it, so, you know, I started off as a journalist. Um, I wrote for People magazine for years. I wrote for newspapers. I freelanced for other magazines. But this was always kind of the end goal. And um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I've been doing this for 20 years now. I actually wrote my first book 20 years ago. Wow. It didn't come out till 2006, but it was written and finished by about this time in 2003, which is crazy. Um, but as far as advice for um, 
for people who might be looking to get into this field, um, I, I would say read as much as you can. Um, it, 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 the more you read, the more you absorb the rhythm of stories and you understand how storytelling works and how an author can deliver an impactful, emotionally satisfying storyline um, in sort of a concise uh, amount of space. Um, so I, I would say read as much as you can and don't be afraid to sit down and start. I think it's daunting to sit down with an empty, uh, an empty computer file, a blank screen and realize that you have to write an entire book but one page a year and you have a book by the end of the year. So don't be afraid to start and you can't fix what you don't have. So you can always edit something if it's not coming out right. Oh, see, that's great inspiration. What what led you down the path to writing? I know you said you, you briefly thought about being a pop star. I mean, who has it, right? <laughs> but was there a moment in your life where you thought, oh, light bulb goes off. I'm going to be a writer. I, you know, I think it was just, I, I mean, I remember as early as five or six writing books, like little books that I stapled together and gave to my mom and said, I've written a book. Um, so I, I think it's something I've always wanted to do, but really I think it was reading that, that kind of sparked that interest in me. I think the moment I realized that these stories that I was so engaged with actually came from a person whose job was to sit down and make up <laughs> stories, I, there was nothing else I wanted to do. and. Um, uh, thankfully, because there's really nothing else I'm good at. So, <laughs> uh, I'm so glad someone pays me to do this. <laughs> it's it's just terrific to see all of your success over the last couple oh, of decades. When thank it comes you. to your books, I'm going to put you on the spot here. They must be like your children in a way, <laughs> right? You give birth to each idea and each story. Do sure, you have yeah. a favorite? That's a great question. I always say my favorite is almost always my most recent. And the reason for that is because I feel like I'm still developing as a writer. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years, but I don't think I've, you know, I I, I hope I never get to the point where I think, ah, oh, I'm perfect. I, I do everything right. Like, I think with every book, I develop a little bit more as a writer. And so I'm a little bit prouder of each book than I was of the previous book because I can see my forward motion, if that makes sense. Sure. But if I had to choose a book from my backlist, it would probably be The Sweetness of Forgetting which was my 2012 novel. Um, and it was the one that marked my transition between writing contemporary women's fiction, which is where I started, to writing historical fiction, which is what I'm doing now. Um, it, it took me a little, while, a little while to find my way into writing the kinds of books I think I was always meant to be writing. Uh, and that was really the book that did it for me. So that was a book that really changed my life and my career. So I, I think for, for that reason, that one's uh, will always be a favorite. You've gone through some life-changing moments within the last year and you recently yes, rang the bell and beat breast mm -hmm. cancer. Talk to us yeah. about your journey. Yeah, it's actually been a year since I was diagnosed. Um, I was 43 when I found, um, or when a, a lump was found in my right breast during an annual standard mammogram. So I have become a huge advocate for staying up to date with your mammograms and other recommended screenings. Because if I had not gone in for that mammogram, if I had said, I don't feel anything, everything's fine, you know, why do I have to do this? It wouldn't have been caught and it was very aggressive and very fast moving. And if I hadn't caught it when I did, um, it would have progressed and it would have been much harder to treat. So I've been through radiation and chemotherapy. Um, that is all about six months behind me now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm cancer free. I am good. Um, but, you know, I, I do also think it's an important message to share that if you have to go through tough times, you will make it just like I did. You discover strength you didn't know you had. Kristen, always great to see you. Congratulations on all your success. KristenHarmel.com is the website for more information on her latest book. So great to see you. She is our Boss Lady of the Week. This is Daily Flash with your hosts, Andrea Jackson and Mitch English. Trending news and entertainment. This is Daily Flash. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am Mitch English. Hi, I'm Audrey Jackson. I'm crying during this We're show. We are having a good time. This is Daily Flash. And this is Monday to give you an idea of exactly oh, uh, what our week's going to be set up for. All right, so, since it is Monday, yeah. tomorrow is Tuesday. What food do you associate with Tuesday? Taco, Taco oh, Tuesday. Tuesday. Right? Everybody knows about Taco yeah. Tuesday, right? Well, uh, uh, Pete, oh, excuse me, uh, ta uh, Taco Bell. I don't know why Pizza Hut here. That's on my mind. going to say Pete's Coffee. Uh, like, Taco, Taco Bell actually went on this campaign because they wanted you use Taco Tuesday. Well, apparently yeah. it is a copyrighted in all, every single state. So they were unable to use it. So they went after a company oh. called Taco John's 
who uh, for the past decades uh, in 49 states, they own the copyright to Taco Tuesday. However, in New Jersey, it was owned by a different company called Gregory. So they had a Taco Tuesday. And so you couldn't use, hey, we're having Taco Tuesday because they owned it because really? of copyright. Well, finally, just last week, Gregory's in New, New Jersey has given up the title for the past 40 years. They've owned Taco Tuesday. They said it's free to everybody now. And so Taco oh, Bell okay. says everybody can use Taco Tuesday now. Okay. A restaurant, we can say, we can have it here on the show now. We could say it's Tuesday, Taco Tuesday. So it's because they gave it up in New Jersey, that means that well, it's they available? Well, the, they were the salt last state because Taco oh. John's owned it in 49 states. Got it. And uh, Gregory's owned it in New Jersey, and they were not giving up the copyright. Well, they found out about it because LeBron James kept doing it online, yes, and they, that's went, right. they were trying to, to go after him. Yeah. yeah. Right. So now, but now he can. Now he can. So now he can. So Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesdays. Well, one man who was uh, aiming to drink 2,000 pints in 200 days has finally reached his goal. For the past 200 days, John May has been keeping track of his drinking goal online. We all have to have goals, right? Well, before we go any <laughs> further, we must round the, the obligatory disclaimer here. We do not encourage encourage anyone to take on this Please challenge. Uh, now back to John. He just kicked back pint number 2,000, completing his 200-day challenge. Now that he's checked this goal off the list, he'll be spending the next 2,000 days allowing his liver to recover. I think you're right. He's not going to be getting uh, insurance, uh, uh, private insurance, anyway, because they ask you on there, and life insurance, how many drinks do you have during the week? He's well, going to have to say, well, the past two months. You publish this on social media. Yeah. And what about future employers? That, that's another thing. What if, uh, you, yeah, you, we could say that you have a history, it seems like, of drinking, uh, but... I don't think he was thinking out that far. And, and you know not. what? And, and for his body, one pint might not do anything at yeah. all. A brewery and, and could think, hire who, who, a, yeah. brewery. a brewery. A brewery would probably sure. be a great tester. At least yeah. if you try 200 different uh, tapes of uh, beer. A, a beer, I mean, that's got to be something. But I think because we had this story about Tommy Lee and him drinking two gallons of vodka daily, I think some people's bodies can right? just process it differently. It, it, it's amazing that, uh, how bodies are different. I, yeah. th and more than likely, he looked like he was fine. He didn't look yeah. like he was extremely uh, unhealthy, but we'll see. All right, this is something we'd love to hear where you're at on yeah. this. So after we're done, we'd love to hear your email uh, 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 sent on to us. A frustrated delivery driver caught on camera engaged in a heated exchange with a couple all over a tip for her their large grocery order. Here's what went down. Watch this. If you can pay for the service, you can pay for the tip as well, don't you? No, I can't. Okay, yeah. that's none of your business. Then you should have went to the store and got it yourself. That's none of your business. No, it is my business because you didn't tip what, me. So why, why do we have to tip you? I didn't say you have to. I'm confused why you didn't when I gave you guys a great service. Well, clearly, I brought we have all to. this stuff. To, do you know how heavy this stuff was? Well, the dispute dragged on for about several minutes, finally ended the worker unloading all the groceries, putting them back into her car. And one of the customers claims they're going to file a report. Viewers had mixed reactions to the video. Uh, actually, some siding with the driver, others defending the customer, saying that a tip is optional, not mandatory. Mm -hmm. And this is something we hear all the time. Yeah. And it's the entitlement that, that people forget that a tip is above and beyond. Yeah. And you don't have to do it. It's something that she did get paid from the company. So it's not like she didn't make any money from exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. And and I, I, I think it's it's gone way too long. And there's going to be people that are just going to say, forget it, I'm not tipping anymore. Those are not the people you want to be around. I just saw an article in the New York Post, they're calling it tipping rage, because everywhere you go, you're asked to either leave a tip, oh, there's just a little extra thing you need to tap here on the screen. It's like, enough already, I've people, had it. People also saying, would you like to contribute to the yada yada? <laughs> no, why don't you, the multi-billion dollar company, give money? It doesn't say anything about matching. I'm buying your sandwich. Yeah, exactly. You do the rest. We're going to have some fun. Stick around. Find out what's happening in the world. We're doing some trending with Jess, and we're going to have some more fun. All that's coming up right here on Daily Flash. Welcome back to Daily Flash. Here's Jessica Reyes with Trending with Jess. Oh my goodness, Halloween is officially here. I cannot, well, well, tomorrow technically, but I want you to meet Louis. He's currently trending on TikTok because it's a first. The first time we meet a jack-o'-lantern who identifies as a, as a person. Listen for yourself. I am not a jack-o'-lantern. My name is Louis. <laughs> 
Oh my goodness, my name is Jessica. And that catchphrase has garnished millions of views on TikTok and even via IG Reels. Personally, I was under the impression that the 13, uh, 13 foot Jack Skeleton from Home Depot would be 2023's hit Halloween decoration. I was clearly in the wrong. Target's popular guy whose ridiculous catchphrase is TikTok gold is an eight foot viral sensation that I had to check out for myself. He's currently sold out at most stores because hello, Halloween is tomorrow, but I have no doubt he'll be back next year. Now in, under, in other trending topics this week, let's talk about the cities that really take their Halloween celebrations serious to another level. Maybe you live in one of these cities. Let's kick things off with number five, Sleepy Hollow, New York. More than two centuries after the legend of Sleepy Hollow, it was written on this place screams spooky fall activities. Visitors can tour the historic 90 acre Sleep Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Other activities visitors can try include the great jack-o'-lantern blaze, ghost tours, street fairs, and more. And I haven't had the opportunity to do it, but maybe that'll be on my to-do list for next Halloween. Now on to uh, number four, Anoka, Minnesota. It's been deemed the Halloween capital of the world. Fun fact, it's believed to be the first organized Halloween event in the U.S. And you might ask yourself, okay, um, where did this idea come from? Well, legend has that they were trying to find ways to distract kids from being mischievous. And it looks like it worked because today, this event has turned into a month full of festivities and family fun. So the kids are being good, although after having a lot of candy, I don't know. Number three on the list is New Orleans, Louisiana. It's no secret that NOLA is a spooky place and full of parties. I mean, Mardi Gras, anyone? This city attracts many tourists for its haunted history and big time party scene. The streets are open to locals and visitors dressed in crazy and also amazing costumes. And the costume shops and voodoo offer, uh, they offer special events too. Now travelers can also go on tours of historic houses and cemeteries in New Orleans and learn why this place is called the most haunted city in America. Again, never been to New Orleans, but another one on my list for next year. Next on the list of the best cities to celebrate Halloween at number two, we have a city that is very close to my heart. It's Orlando, Florida. Diverse celebrations await you in the magical city. There's theme parks that really go all out for Halloween, like Universal Orlando Resort. It holds its annual Halloween Horror Nights. Um, Special event ticket holders can choose from numerous haunted houses, including Stranger Things, because I know that's something you want to see in person. Last of Us fans, they have something for you too. And if you don't want something that's too, too scary, there's Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween at Disney World. Um, talk about a cute event for the kiddos and adults like myself who obsess over trick or treat time. This event has a more family friendly vibe and SeaWorld also offers Spooktacular that is also an event for the entire family. So Orlando offers an incredible nightlife vibe during Halloween. Halloween that offers some of Orlando's best costumes. Spooky fans hit the downtown Orlando area and show off some of their best ideas. So it's a really cool place and no, I'm not being biased because I live here. Now, number one on the list is the must place, okay? This, this shouldn't surprise anyone. We're gonna talk about Salem, Massachusetts. It's, am it's amazing, it's America's witch city. The site of the infamous Salem witch trials in 1692, and according to everyone, it's the best place to celebrate Halloween. Costume crowds fill the streets in celebration of the spookiest night of the year. You get to see the home where Hocus Pocus was recorded at. I mean, there's lots of fun in Salem, Massachusetts, so if that's one of the places you wanna check out for Halloween, you must be there. Maybe you can invite me. Guys, that's all for today. Maybe um, next time I'll do a Christmas list of places to celebrate. Nearly 50% of North America's population will have myopia by 2030. So why is nearsightedness becoming more common among kids and adults? Joining us to talk about the only FDA approved treatment is Dr. Felicia Timmerman with Cooper Vision. Hi, doctor. Great news, there are treatment options that can help. There's the MySight One Day Contact Lens, the only FDA approved product to slow the progression of myopia in children. So it has a dual benefit. It will correct children's vision to put them into visual clarity, just like they would get with standard glasses or contact lenses. But through that innovative technology of this contact lens, it's also able to slow the progression of myopia simultaneously. And it's FDA approved for the indication 
completion of treatment at 8 to 12 years old. So we know that children in that first decade of life are already able to successfully and independently wear this contact lens. So please visit mysight.com, that's M-I-S-I-G-H-T.com to learn more about myopia and the MySight One Day Contact Lens to see if your child is a candidate for it. It also provides a locator to find eye care practitioners in your area that's prescribing these lenses. Thank you, doctor. Well, in this day and age of home improvement, it's all about sustainability. Here's Jenny and Dave Mars, the hosts of HGTV's Fixer to Fabulous, along with Mark Ballinger from Daikin Comfort Technologies of North America. Um, you know, sustainability is this word that feels overwhelming at times, and it really doesn't have to be. Um, it is, can be really simple easy things that you can do in your own home, like turn off the lights when you leave the room, turn off the water while you're brushing your teeth, all of those things that we grew up hearing from our parents, we can instill in our own kids today. Yeah. And while they feel incredibly simple, they really are incredibly important. And then of course, there's big things like technology and incorporating sustainable technology into your home. The reason we partnered with Daikin on this sustainability series is because of the work that they're doing. It is a six part mini series where we actually dive into some of these issues of sustainability that seem overwhelming, that seem out of reach. I mean, for example, heating and cooling is 40 to 60% of our energy use. I mean, that's a big one. And that's how we got to know Mark and Daikin because they are leading the charge on sustainability in HVAC. Just to explain it simply, right? One of, one of the key technology that we uh, like to talk about on, uh, on the show, on the sustainability series, is the heat pump technology, right? A heat pump is a system that heat and cool the home only using electricity. So in the winter, uh, we can replace, uh, in a lot of cases, a gas furnace, right? right? Mm -hmm. With an all electric heat pump. So we can extract the heat energy from the outside air, right? And bring it inside the home through a traditional refrigeration cycle, right? Most people are familiar with, with air conditioning. It's essentially the same thing, except you can reverse the cycle for winter and heat the house mm -hmm. as well at the same time. And what the, the homeowners are going to discover in the next few months is that now there is going to be a change in, in heating and cooling system where manufacturers will be using a low global warming potential refrigerant. So what, what we would recommend for, for the users in about a year, a year and a half, is to look at the mark that's called R32 that indicates that your refrigerant used in the system now has a very low global warming potential. You can find the sustainability series at sustainabilityseries.com. It's eczema awareness month and a recent survey reveals 64% of black Americans suffer from skin irritations with only 31% seeking treatment. Skincare leader Avino is on a mission to change this for more than 200,000 women of color. Here's more. Thank you for having me. October is eczema awareness month and Avino is helping to support those who suffer with eczema, especially in the Black community, as a recent survey revealed that 64% of Black Americans suffer from some kind of skin concern, such as eczema or sensitive skin. Yet 31% have never seen a dermatologist. Getting an accurate diagnosis and finding therapeutic solutions can be a real struggle for people of color. The fact that only 3% of all dermatologists are Black, myself included, combined the lack of training for doctors specific to black and brown skin can lead to the underdiagnosis of skin conditions, creating significant inequities in skin health. If you are experiencing sensitive skin, I encourage you to visit a dermatologist. Look for brands that are dermatologist recommended like Aveeno and to check out their website for more information on skin conditions. Aveeno is a skincare leader whose products I recommend and trust. They are dedicated to supporting the Black community with information and resources through their Skin Visibility Program. This year, they teamed up with Health in Her Hue, a leading digital platform that helps to connect women of color with culturally sensitive healthcare providers like me. Together, they're delivering skin health resources to more than 200,000 women of color through educational health content, virtual events, and more. Learn more and join the skin health conversation at healthinherhue.com. Hey, what if you couldn't turn on the tap and actually get drink, the clean drinking water? Or maybe you flushed and the wastewater didn't go anywhere? Ugh. Well, this month marks the ninth annual Imagine a Day Without Water. Here's more info. 
Imagine a Day Without Water is a national day of action that brings us together to celebrate the value of water, but also to acknowledge that it is absolutely essential for our daily lives, for public safety, for a healthy environment, and for a thriving economy. And to acknowledge that water is not just a resource, but it's a lifeline for all of us. Yet so often it's taken for granted. But I also would invite you to take a moment and think about where your clean water comes from. Maybe visit your local water utilities website. Uh, it's more than likely that they are participating in today's day of action, but they also will have information about how you can get involved or become more educated around water challenges and solutions in your community. Please visit our website, uh, imagineadaywithoutwater.org, for information on everything that we've discussed today and for ideas on how you can get involved. With Halloween here, homeowners are going out of their way to make their home homes look spooky. But when homeowners put off routine fixes around the house, homes can start feeling scary year round. <laughs> Joining us with more is home care expert and Thumbtack expert, David Stakel. Hey, David. We recently conducted a survey at Thumbtack and found that almost half of the folks surveyed thought that their home was haunted at one point or another. The three main reasons that rose to the top were 47% because of doors closing unexpectedly when no one was around, 38% of respondents because of noises coming from inside the walls, and 28% of folks were scared at one point or another because of creaky floors. The good news is the odds are it's not paranormal activity causing these, and in fact there are easy fixes to take care of them. So if a door is closing unexpectedly, most likely the solve there is a simple hinge adjustment that you can do on your own. Thumbtack has provided millions of homeowners with the solutions they need to take care of their homes by providing personalized guidance to help homeowners know what to do, when to do it, and why to do it. For more information, you can visit us at thumbtack.com haunted. You can also download Thumbtack at either app store. Hey, welcome back to Daily Flash. It's time for us to take a look at the lifestyles of the, the rich, rich and famous. famous. We're going to dive into some celebrity real estate. Okay, got your checkbook out? Uh, oh, yeah. Me, yes, I have a credit card. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's start with the Greenwich, Connecticut estate one's owned by fashion designer Tommy Hilfiger. It is back on the market for $9.65 million. The historic home was built back in 1932 to look like an English manor. The nearly 8,000 square foot spread features seven bedrooms, eight baths, and sits on more than five acres of property. Look at that. The mansion includes a chef's kitchen, a large family room, a formal dining room, four fireplaces, and a study with a fancy ceiling. There's also a one-bedroom guest space above the garage and a tennis court, and of course, a fabulous pool. Yeah, and Tommy Hilfiger, you know it's going to be designed yeah, really gorgeous. nice. It's going to be great. Hollywood uh, Housewives, rather, couple, Troy, Croy Bierman and Kim Zolziak, they're now selling their Georgia mansion. How much? Six million. The estranged couple listed their two-story, seven-bedroom, 11-bathroom estate at almost double what it was listed for earlier this month. The property, built in 2008, has a heated pool, five fireplaces, a six-car garage, a chef's kitchen, a full-size bar and wine cellar. It also has a number of huge walk-in closets, an elevator, a billiard room, a movie theater, a gym, and a massage room. The couple bought that mansion back in 2012 for $880,000. So they're trying to make some cash off this. And a picture of them in every single room. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and name one of your favorite TV sitcoms, and there's a good chance Chuck Lorre was behind its success from The Big Bang Theory and Two and a Half Men. Lorre's produced or directed some of America's most popular TV shows. And now one of his properties is available for rent. Oh, okay. Fully furnished for forty grand a month. Wow. Who has that kind of money for rent? Wow! You can get this four-bedroom, five-bath home with fifty-three hundred square feet of living space. The house includes a large living room, dining area, breakfast nook, plus media and family rooms. There's also an extra bedroom and bath with its own entrance, which could be used as an office or playroom. And the kitchen features two islands and a large pantry with an extra fridge. Now I do want to remind everybody and look at the disclaimer because they're only going to have like the fine print up really quickly. Do you know what I'm referring to? Uh, no, I don't. At the end of every Chuck Lorre production, he has he writes a whole paragraph. Oh, and it's it? only on the screen for about two seconds. What does and, it say? Well, it'll say something different every single time. No way. And you're meant to pause it on your DVR to read it. So next time, like Two and a Half Men or a Chuck Lorre Ooh. production, at the very end of for the credits, pause, pause it. it. You'll be able to read this dissertation. It could be about anything. He has different ones. Oh, I love time. that little tidbit. End of our show. Nothing like that. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you when we look at you.